Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Lori Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is 9 o'clock here in the morning, Calgary, Alberta, Thursday, October the 28th, and I'm happy to be here. This is One Child Abuse Survivor to Another. It's a 30-minute live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. And the chat room is open, and I've got the link in there for anybody who wants to check this out. Um, I want to continue talking about the information on uh, the website Anger Resources, www.angerresources, A-N-G-E-R-E-S-O-U-R-C-E-S.com. And that's Dave Decker and Michael Obsat's website. And they have some great information on there, uh, everything to do with, like, road rage and, you know, how to handle uh, or how to how to sort of work through and handle our own anger issues if we have them. And I find it very very helpful. So I hope the listeners are, too. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in to all my shows. I really appreciate it. I'm not a counselor, not a therapist. I don't hold any certificates in those areas. I'm just a private citizen paying to do my own blog talk shows. I'm a survivor of child abuse and secondhand victim and survivor of domestic violence. And I've just uh, lived a whole lifetime, uh, you know, of of abuse and abuse-related issues. So I just wanted to be one more voice out there, you know, to... For people just to say there is hope, there is help. Just keep reaching out, keep moving at your own pace. You know, um, look for the help where you can find it. Care, you know, find a, th- a therapist, a counselor, a group support, online group support, um, crisis lines, whatever you have to do to get some help. Right. So that's the thing. I just want to be one more voice, really, out here, just to say we we do deserve to have a good life. We do count. We do matter. And um, you know, I. I know myself how hard it is as a survivor to walk this daily walk, and I just thought, well, you know, while I'm searching out my own information for my own healing journey, I can just share what I find very helpful with other people. So um, thanks, everybody, for being here. I really appreciate it. Uh, We're going to pick up where we left off yesterday, which was looking at the steps to stop abuse, and I've got the link there in the chat room. And uh, if you're a young person under the age of 18, I just ask that you have an adult listen to the show with you or, you know, let let an adult know what you're listening to. This is, uh, there's a lot of adult content on my shows. I'm talking all about abuse, right? So you have to listen at your own discretion. And you, and people under the age of 18, I just think, you know, you should be protected at all times. I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children, and that's what we do is uh, really fight for child rights, fight for child protection, and uh, stand up, you know, uh, and advocate on behalf of children to say that, you know, children need protection. We need to stop child abuse. And um, you got to be really careful what you're doing online and realize that there are, you know, at any given time, hundreds of thousands of child sexual predators online trying to get a hold of children. So you can find information all over the web about how to keep yourself safe just by typing into your browser online safety for children, internet safety, things like this, and it will bring up websites that will tell you and show you exactly how to stay safe online, right? The FBI has a great one. I like the one that's on the FBI's website for parents and for children. And um, just learn how to keep yourself safe, right? You cannot, I can't, just can't stress that enough, right? You really need to be careful. Um, so, yeah, I just, um, yeah, everyone has to listen at their own discretion to my shows or any shows like this, you know. Uh, the topics of abuse are very sensitive, and so people you know, may find the the show makes them uncomfortable or anything like this might make you uncomfortable. You really have to know what, what you're safe enough to listen to and um, what's okay for you to listen to. It is your discretion. So be sure, and, and you know, if the show makes you uncomfortable, just turn it off, right? Um, so we'll get right into this article here. This is a, we left off on step number seven, and I'm just going to the link right now. The the Dave Decker, he's got some awesome stuff here. I know Michael Opset says too. We haven't even got to his stuff yet. There there's a lot of information on this website, and uh, really there's 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 books, videos, seminars, self tests, links, and facts about anger and anger management, right? All from Dave Decker and Michael Opset, and they are in the field, you know, of 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 you know counseling and therapy and and helping people, right? So you can check out what they have to say about themselves. There's uh, tools and resources, and there's all kinds of links, you know, to their articles. And uh, this one article is called Taking the Steps to Stop the Abuse. It's by Dave Dave Decker, uh, M-A-N-L-P. And um, uh, there's 20 steps to his book. And so he wrote a book, um, and he says here that uh, the... The 20 steps from his book, Stopping the Violence, a group model to change men's abusive attitudes and behaviors, are critical in the process of change if you make the decision to do something about anger, abuse, and control issues in your own life. And so he's listed the 20 steps here from his book. And the book, you know, is, is he's, he's addressing men's abusive attitudes and behaviors. But really, when I read through it, you know, this is really good for anybody because... 
Uh, women can be abusive too. Women can be abusers. Women can be controlling. Women can be uh, can have anger management and anger problems too, right? So I think this just works for everybody. I mean, this is just really good advice. Uh, and what he has to say here, number one, we, we already went through this. Acknowledge to yourself and others that you have a problem with anger, abuse, and control. Number two, address mental health and chemical use issues when they are present in your life. Number three, come to know that when you are abusive to others, you are always feeling inadequate, insecure, powerless, and unlovable. Number four, realize that realize that controlling and abusive behavior hurts you and those you love. Number five, understand that anger is different from abuse and control. Number six, recognize that becoming abusive is always a choice. And number seven, take responsibility for what you feel, how you think, and how you act instead of blaming others. And we went through those and uh, yesterday and the day before. And um, uh, question eight, where, we were, where I want to pick up, was accept that you cannot fix, change, or control other people. Uh, he writes here, the paradox about being controlling is that the more you try to control people and situations around you, the more frustrated and out of control you end up feeling, which sets you up to become even more controlling and abusive in your life. And this is just a fact. You know, I mean, I know this firsthand uh, from my mom. You know, she was um, really trying to control the situation in the home, and, and there was a lot of domestic violence and abuse between her and my dad. And the issues with my brothers, everyone was seeming to be out of control in the home. Really, we weren't. We were just in crisis mode all the time. And so my mom would try to control the situation and would become even more abusive if she couldn't control a certain aspect. Like, for instance, my dad or, or my behavior, she would try to control how I was behaving. And then um, because the whole home was out of whack and out of control, um, she'd become even more abusive, right? So that's the thing, just always uh, escalating, escalating further and further, right? And so the abuse just got worse and worse and worse. And it was, you know, really she was hurting herself too because she was ruining the relationships between her children and uh, her husband. That that Their marriage was already in, in shambles. So uh, they could have got help. They were ordered court-ordered counseling. You know, they were court-ordered to go get marital uh, counseling and they didn't do it. So sadly enough, and they were supposed to get help for the children as well. We were all supposed to go to counseling. And, um, you know, they went for two sessions and that was it. We were out of the country and they just blew it off. You know, they didn't they didn't get any help. So they continued their stuff right on until my mom passed away 15 years ago. So this is the thing. Uh, we, we have to accept that we cannot fix, change, or control other people because... We are really only in control of ourselves, really. That is our responsibility to control our own behavior, to, you know, control what we are doing and what we are uh, thinking and what we are saying, right? We can't really control what other people are doing. So if everybody was in control of how they were thinking and feeling and what they were doing, we wouldn't have these abuse-related issues. We wouldn't have abuse if everybody would take responsibility and do the right thing by their family members and by people in their life, even at work, you know, work situations, um, anywhere in your life. This this is really um, kind of, you know, relates to every everything in life, right? It's like how we handle things, how we deal with things. If we were all responsible for our own behavior and would take a good hard look at how we're behaving, the whole world would be a lot better place, right? So we can't help what other people are going to do. I couldn't control what my parents were going to do. You know, I, I couldn't control what my parents thought and how my mom felt towards me. And this is the whole issue, you know, with the survivor issues, you know, like I can't go back and fix or change what happened in the past. You know, I can't go back and uh, and magically erase all that abuse and just make it go away and pretend it didn't happen. Uh, I can't, you know, be responsible for what other people do around me even today. But what I can do is be very be, be responsible for myself, and you know, and and look out for myself, and and try to live the most healthy, you know, the the most um, the most decent lifestyle that I can. You know what I mean? And and we are ultimately responsible for that. So we have to be careful what we are doing, so we're not becoming abusive or controlling or um, having these issues where we're hurting people around us just because we are having our own issues, which is what my parents did, right? So that's the thing. It's so important that we don't become the abusers, the the controlling abusers, you know. And we have every obligation to make sure that we don't. And if everybody would do that, there would be no more abuse, right? That's just the whole issue. Uh, number nine, remember that you can always take a timeout in a potentially explosive situation. He says here, we have always known that timeouts can be a good strategy for children. They are also a good strategy for us as adults. 
A timeout is not a magic cure-all, but it can allow you to take a break and get away temporarily before you say or do something that you will only end up regretting later. Part of taking a respectful timeout, however, is making and keeping a commitment to yourself and your partner that you will return to address the problem or issue at a later time when you have calmed yourself down. And hopefully you will, will, you will not make the timeout strategy into, into simply another weapon in your arsenal of be, be, abusive behaviors, right? So this is the thing. Um, yeah, that's that's just the whole issue, I think. You know, I wish my, my parents would have taken some timeouts, especially my mom. Um, my mom needed to take some timeouts. You know, she would rage and become completely explosive. And whatever she could reach for and grab is whatever she would beat you with. So, you know, it would depend on what she had in her hands or even just her fists if she couldn't get a hold of anything. My dad was also very much like that, and they never took a time out. They never stopped for a moment to say, hmm, you know, it seems like I'm getting angry and I'm going to hurt my child. Uh, maybe I better step away from this for a minute so I can think clearly so that I don't hurt my child. They never did that, and that's why the abuse happened, right? Um, it wasn't discipline. It was abuse, right? So... That's a whole issue. They they wouldn't even do that for each other. They would just lash out at each other and hurt each other, even out in public. And so um, they were very volatile people and never took a time out. They just let it let it let it ride. You know, whatever was going to happen was going to happen. People's heads were busted. Um, you know, people were beaten. People were uh, completely misused and you know mistreated. And they never ever even thought of taking a time out. So, you know, I think it's very important for people to do that. I'm doing that kind of right now. I'm taking a time out for my family, uh, my my own, you know, my family members, uh, because I don't want to say anything that I'm going to regret later. <laughs> so, because I've we've been doing that to each other for years, and so, um, you know, I decided to take a bit of a time out until I can figure out how I'm going to approach them because I'm on my healing journey. So I'm completely now separate from them. Uh, they're not on this journey with me, and they don't support what I'm doing. Uh, they don't like what I'm doing and they actually hate what I'm doing. So uh, I know there's going to be some hurt feelings and I know there is some hurt feelings. Uh, but nobody really cares about my feelings and the way I felt about being abused and beaten and uh, sexually used as a child. Um, it kind of bums me right out that my family doesn't care um, at all that this stuff happened to me. And they just love uh, this pretend family that they think in their minds we used to have, right? Because they've they've made it okay uh, in their own minds. That's why they're they're in denial. They have created some other fantasy thing that, oh, well, mom used to bake cookies. Yeah, but mom used to bash my head in with a rolling pin and, you know, or just beat me, you know, uh, all the time, right, senseless. And so the thing is, is, you know, I know my mom used to make cookies and she even bought me Christmas presents and wrapped them. Um, you know, she also kicked the shit out of me, you know what I mean? Um, I know, you know the reality for me is that, you know, is is the reality. It's the whole picture. I did not block out or, you know, pretend that this wasn't happening, right? I was able to keep a very realistic look of what was happening in our family. And, so not, and this abuse was not just directed to myself. I witnessed abuse to my brothers as well and, and my sister. So, you know, I, I totally remember quite a bit of it. So I didn't create this false family, which they all did, and, and just in order to survive, I think that's why they did it. Um, I was able to keep it kind of separate and realize that, hey, yeah, my mom did bake cookies, and she was also a very vicious and mean woman who told me I was born out of rape and that she did not love me or want me. And so I was able to keep the two separate, mom that bakes cookies and mom that hurts me, right? But they all just kind of blocked that all out, right, and conveniently created this this false existence that never really was. So we're not on the same page, right? So I'm taking a time out because I uh, right now I'm I'm moving through my healing journey at a pretty rapid rate, feel pretty good about it, and I don't want them um I don't want to have to go reverting back to screaming and hollering at them and cursing at them like I used to because that's what they do to me. And that's what my dad does to me still even today and that's what my sister is very capable of doing to me although she's a one of these passive aggressive types and pretends that she's not capable of this stuff, but she is. And so I don't want to say anything hurtful. And so I'm going to back off for a while until I can figure out how I'm going to talk to them to let them know that, hey, I'm on a, my healing journey. Uh, it doesn't matter to me whether they ever accept it or not. And that I still love them. I always will. And that uh, I wish them the best of everything. But, you know, I can't take any more of their abusive garbage and they're going to have to start seeing me in a different light. You know what I mean? Because they're going to have to start having some respect for me as a 45-year-old woman who's making some huge progress in my life and as well as trying to do as much as I can to help stop and prevent child abuse, right? So 
um, I'm just asking for some respect from them, which I think I deserve and I think I've earned. And uh, because I'm not continuing to hold uh, grudges against them or you know treat them badly, I want uh, I, I want a good relationship between us all, right? That's of course the goal. And so I'm taking a time out right now. And sometimes I think people just need to, you know. And I wish my parents would have taken a time out. I really do. Because the, a lot of the abuse wouldn't have happened if my parents would have taken a time out. And, or given the kids some time, time out as well. Number 10, think about the potential consequences before you become controlling and abusive. It says domestic assault is illegal. You can lose your freedom and end up in jail. But even more important, you have the potential to damage or even completely lose your relationships with your partner and children for the rest of your life. And, I mean, this is a fact. This is truth. And, um, you know, like my uh, my parents, you know, my mom would never apologize for her behavior because she wanted to just completely blame my dad for it. It was all his fault. And it was all the children's fault. It was always my fault or... It was never her fault, right, that she would uh, beat, and, beat and abuse people, right, and verbally assault you and physically assault you, right? She was the victim always. And um, even in, even though she was also the abuser and the perpetrator and my main abuser, she was always the victim, right, because she wanted to just blame everybody else for her whole problems in her life. And, of course, you know, I mean, my dad, he wasn't treating her right, that's for sure. And, you know, she needed help, but she should have gotten out. And the thing is, is my dad didn't care that he wasn't treating her right. You know, he would call her names. Uh, he was physically abusive to her, sexually abusive to her, uh, forcing her to have sex when she didn't want to, which is really called marital rape, you know. And um, he was a horrible man. He was absolutely horrible. Did not care about her personal well-being or health, uh, mental health or physical well-being. Um, and he caused a lot of problems for her in her lifetime, physical as well as as mental and emotional, right? And so my dad, you know, we used to tell him, you're lucky we even talked to you. Uh, because of what we know that, you know, the my brothers and, and even some of the sisters would say this to him, um, you know, that you're lucky that we even have anything to do with you because of what you did to our mother and to us. And he would he would even admit that, you know, that that was true. And he would say, you know, you're so right. I'm just very blessed that any of my children will have anything to do with me. So he kind of, you know, he sort of wants to try to, to make up for this stuff, even though he will not admit what he did. Um, he... You know, he knows he hurt his family, right? Whereas my mom would never, ever, ever admit that she had done anything wrong and tried to, to make amends, right? And so, you know, they completely destroyed their family. They destroyed the relationships between each other. Uh, they destroyed the relationships between themselves and the children. You know, they my dad really, really messed with my brother's mind. So one of my brother's killed himself at the age of 33 um he was the one that reported the abuse because he went to school and he was all beaten up and everything and the nurses noticed and they went they took him to the the nurse the, the teacher noticed took him to the nurse's office and they they questioned him and they checked him out and they called the the authorities and they the the uh, cps or dhs whichever one got involved and they you know brought my parents up on a child abuse charges right and so there was uh, five of us in the home at the time, and two of my siblings had already moved out because one was 17, the other one was 16, and they both were gone. And so the younger kids, younger than that, like like 14 and younger, were still in the home, and there was five of us. So, you know, the courts were like, well, you have to get counseling, you have to get, uh, or we're going to remove the children, right, because there's abuse going on here, and you need help, and your kids need help. So they they had to the court ordered them to go to counseling. The judge did, and my mom said that she begged and pleaded, you know, for the courts to let her keep her children. She she said, oh, I told the courts, that, you know, my children are all I have, right? And then she turned around, uh, you know, and abused us our whole lives, right, the rest of our lives. And then, as an adult, when I was 28 years old, told me that she never wanted any of us, and that we didn't mean anything to her. And I said, you got to be kidding me. I said, what, you know, you got to be kidding me. You put us through this. You had the chance to let us go. You had the chance to let the courts take us out of the home and let us go, and, and you kept us around for what, you know, so you could abuse us and ruin our lives and completely mentally uh, and emotionally destroy our minds, twist our minds into this wreckage, you know. So one of my brothers committed suicide at the age of 33, and my other brother died of a drug overdose at the age of 43 in a shelter. And another one of my brothers was murdered, so really that doesn't really count. But the thing is, is you know, it's absolutely horrible what what that does to people. And so people should just know that, you know, your behavior, my behavior can cause this, right? The, this, is, this is what causes this kind of stuff. It's our behaviors. We cannot, you know, keep on, 
you know, working through that cycle of abuse, right? So if we were abused and, and we grew up around this stuff, we have to really work work overtime and extra hard to make sure that we're not abusing other people and that we're not hurting other people and that we're not hurting ourselves, right? And this is so important because people like to, my mom used to like to blame everybody. It was the whole world's fault that, uh, you know, it, was, it definitely was not her fault. And she was the one swinging the rolling pin, and, and you know, and 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 swinging her fists at me, and you know, uh, swinging her words at me, right? But she would never ever take responsibility for it. So that's the whole issue. We have to be very, very responsible for what we're doing, and know that abuse is wrong. It's illegal. It's against the law, and know that you know we could, and and even more so that we can completely ruin our relationships with other people by doing that. So that's why it's so important that we don't become these controlling, abusive people that our parents were or that our caregivers were or that are, you know, in our own domestic violence situations. If you're involved in a, or I was involved in a domestic uh, violence and abuse situation, that I don't pass that cycle on to my children, right? It's so important. So that's what we, so it's, it's really up to us. It is completely our responsibility. Um, number 11 is identify clearly what triggers your anger and your controlling and abusive behavior. So it's a start to get to know yourself. Tune in to what you are experiencing internally. For example, your thoughts, feelings, and physical sensations, and what you are reacting to that is going on around you. For example, situations, people, places, times that are triggers for you. Abusive people rarely have a good sense of the totality of what is contributing to their personal escalation process because they're just in confusion. They're not thinking clearly, right? Obviously, anybody who would beat their children and beat their wife or husband uh, calling them names, trying to emotionally and psychologically and, and physically control every move and abusing them is not thinking clearly. They're not thinking properly. They're being hurtful. And so what's the problem behind that? That's what we have to know. We have to get in touch with what causes us to to be abusive, to be controlling, right? And then find out what the triggers are and then figure out what happens when we do do that so that we can make sure next time that we're in that situation that we have something to go by and we can control it and we can we can change that behavior right cuz sometimes i think people think they're doing it because they they feel like they feel out of control you know and they feel like maybe that person doesn't love them or you know that person's going to leave them or they're not good enough it's a lot have a lot to do with self esteem i think you know and a lot of um uh, pressure put on you know that people put on themselves not so much that people other people put on people i think it's the pressure we put on ourselves right to try to 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 be perfect all the time and and then if if, if somebody kind of you know sub, points out something that we're doing or points out something that we we could do better sometimes criticism and whatnot causes us to maybe you know feel this whole lack of self self esteem thing come on then we're start then we start to maybe get a little bit defensive because I know this is my case, you know, like um, my anger really stems from from low self esteem, lack of confidence, and the ability, the, the, the thoughts and the and the knowledge that I was not wanted as a child and that I was not cared about, not loved, right? I just wasn't shown any love. So, you know, my whole thing is is very much based on the defensive. So if I think somebody's trying to hurt me or trying to do something. I, that's going to be hurtful to me. I'm already on the defensive, and I'm like, "You're not going to hurt me. I'll hurt you first. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I'm tired of it. And it's like, so I have to be very careful, you know, not to assume that everybody's out to get me, and actually find out what their motives are first, and then go from there. Right. So I'm learning how to deal with this stuff. Even at work, I have a lot of problems with jobs, and I don't quit every job. I mean, I've stayed at jobs for ten years, and five years, seven years. You know. But the thing is, is I have quit a few really good jobs because of these situations that I, you know, probably would have hung on to those jobs had I known how to um, identify what the situation was, you know, why I was feeling the way I was, and then learn how to properly handle it instead of just saying, that's it, you've hurt me, so now I'm quitting, I'm leaving. And, you know, even though the people were willing to work with me on it and they apologized, I mean, I for I actually forced them to apologize formally and then because that's just the type of person that I am. And I said, you know, you guys owe me an apology and so they did. They did apologize. But then the fact is is I couldn't work there anymore. It just reminded me too much of the relationship that I had with my mom who had hurt me so extremely badly. You know, the my the abuse that my dad put on me, I, a lot of physical abuse as well as mental abuse, but I don't it didn't seem to affect me like the abuse that my mom put on me, probably because I didn't really care about my dad, but I really loved my mom. 
And my dad, I, I mean, I have to say, I honestly didn't really care about him as a child because he was trying to kill us, you know, like he tried to kill me and my sister by driving us over a cliff and he was trying to take me away from my mom, trying to take me to California one time. I was ready to jump out of the car and I was only like four years old. And I mean, you know, he, I just didn't trust him and I didn't build any kind of a bond with him. I didn't build a bond with my mom either, but I really needed my mom and I, I that bond was not there. So I was just, I knew this thing was lacking, you know, and I knew my mom didn't, really didn't want me around and didn't really love me and didn't care, you know what I mean? So that definitely carried over into my adult life, you know what I mean? And so the minute I think somebody's upset with me, somebody doesn't like me, you know, somebody that, not somebody who doesn't have any influence in my life, but people that are, that are, that I look up to, you know, or that I'm kind of looking for um, some sort of an acceptance from, right? Uh, if if I feel that that person doesn't truly doesn't care about me, then this whole feeling from the, my childhood comes back, and all of a sudden I'm harboring all kinds of bad feelings. And then you know if they say anything rude or do anything to me that's hurtful within a period of time, I'm on the defensive you know right away, thinking okay this is crap, I don't need any more of this. So it's almost like I put these people in my mom's place, you know, and it's like. It's not their fault. It's not their fault that I was abused as a child, right? So it's it's like what I have to learn. You know, I'm really, that's what I'm doing this last year or so is learning how to deal with that, right? And it's a process. It's definitely a process. It doesn't happen overnight. And I have to, because I have to learn the triggers, I have to learn my behaviors. I have to learn why I'm doing what I'm doing. So I'm always analyzing. And it takes time. You know, it takes time to go through this stuff, and I'm doing it on my own. You know, I, I wouldn't suggest that for anybody. I would hope that people would go get help if you really need to. Um, I just feel like I, well, first of all, I can't afford a counselor. If a counselor came to me and said, hey, free counseling for you, I'd be like, right on. Um, but, see, I have no money for counseling. I don't even hardly have any money for this blog talk show. So the whole issue is, is like, you know, I got I have no benefits and no money. So, right, I can't go to counseling or therapy, and I'm not going to go try to get government assistance. So eventually I might get a, th- a therapist or a counselor. I'll talk to a counselor first, and then we'll see. But by then, you know, I hope to have a lot of this stuff straightened out. There are a few things I really need to work through, and uh, that's the child sexual molestation that I that I uh, suffered at the hands of a sibling, which I, I blocked a lot out, and I'd like to get in touch with it So uh, because I want to heal and move on from it, right? But there there are some things I still want to work through, and I, I, I definitely think I need ther- a therapist or a counselor for that. But this other stuff, I'm learning how to do this, and uh, we have to put it in motion. You know, It's like I could go see a counselor or a therapist, but then again, if I don't do it myself and put it in, into motion and, and practice it and, and learn how to do it, it won't do me any good anyway. They can't do the work for me. You know what I mean? I have to, I'm the one that needs to do this, and I'm the one that needs to be responsible for my own uh, healing. Right, we can't expect somebody else to do this for us. And I, I used to feel that way. I thought I wish somebody could take my pain away. I wish there was some way somebody could do something for me. You know what I mean? And I, and it was very unrealistic because who can do that for us? Nobody. But what we can do is get help from people who are trained and and know how to help us. Right? And we can also do some self help, which is learning how to love ourselves. You know, a therapist can't can't teach us that. We have to learn how to love ourselves. And I mean, that took me, I had to seriously look at my inner child and learn how to love her. She was so wounded and angry and she was completely abused. You know what I mean? And I had to learn how to hold her and how to hug her and how to tell her that I loved her and that, you know, she didn't deserve that treatment, you know, and and then nurture her, like the nurturing that she really needed from my mom, which she didn't get. And so I've done a lot of work, you know, in the last three and a half years. And I, I would hope that everybody would 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 just reach out and get some help wherever you can. You know, make the decision to to have a decent life. You sure deserve it, let me tell you. And if, you know, you did not deserve to be hurt. You did not deserve to be abused in any way. So make sure that, you know, you just reach out and get some help. I'm so glad that I finally reached out and broke the silence and, and got myself some help. You know, like this is, I, I, I got into uh, online group support, which I really like because I just felt there was safety in numbers. And uh, you can go on anonymously if you don't want to give your name. You can just be, you can just use a false name. And that way you can still talk to people and get validation and get, you know, some help from people who have been there. They understand. They've been there. And so that's what I did. And it was very, very helpful. 
And so, I mean, I would, you know, I, I, for myself, it worked for me, but it might not work for you because what works for me might not work for you and what works for you might not work for me. We're all different, right? So whatever you do, make sure you get some help and don't suffer in silence, right? Make sure you get some help. Have a great day, everybody. We'll talk to you again uh, tomorrow, same time, same place, uh, 9 o'clock instead of 6 o'clock, uh, one child abuse survivor to another. And if you need any, any kind of resources or information from the stuff that I've been reading from and, and uh, working through, online let me know because i have all the links and references and whatnot so um i keep all that stuff so you know if you need any help or whatever finding information let me know you know i'm here i'll be around uh, blog talk radio facebook whatnot you can get a hold of me take care everybody have a great day you do count you do matter you matter to me and i keep saying that but it's true so hang in there you know just keep looking for that hope where you can find it right talk to you soon bye-bye